felt the Lord just, I mean, this has been a long journey for many of you who know, coming into healthiness, um, but just recently I felt the Lord go, and that's another level of awareness that you're going to no longer have. I don't want you to even know about other people's neediness with you. Because you know, you know, like, you can feel the temperature, right, that someone's at, that, that atmosphere, and the Lord goes, I don't, I don't have you to be tuned into that anymore. I have you to be tuned into my heart and what I'm doing. So, um, no, people know who belongs here. <laughs> Greg goes, should I fill out these other circles? But you know who these are. So, uh, who goes here? I think that living this kind of a life is about saying a big yes to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit, to the Father, saying a huge yes to intimacy and relationship and allowing him to reign in us and with other people and letting go of our own need to rescue others. I am learning every day to become much more aware of my responses to other people. Have you guys been in this journey too? I'm becoming much more aware of how other people's comments are causing a reaction in me. And then instead of trying to solve it externally, I am learning to take my reaction before the Lord and to release it. So instead of somebody's hurtful comment or some, whatever it is, a blow up in our, not that this ever, no, no, no blow ups ever. But in, instead of having that then be focused on what we need to solve between us, I am going to centered prayer to that space and going, Lord, I am releasing to you my response to this so that we can have a bigger conversation. That whole process in the overflow room was letting go of my needs, my perceived needs, my perceived wants, and my perceived experience, desire, desires for experience. And as I kept saying yes and staying in that room, the Lord started to show me his heart. And he gave me such a rich revelation of who he is and how he operates. And so let me um, give you another example, because you all have millions of examples like this in your life. But... Um, let me see how I can share this. Many of you know that our anniversary gift that Greg gave me for our 10-year anniversary was patio furniture. And <laughs> I know, and it was $10,000 worth of patio furniture. Like this was like the biggest chunk of money we have ever spent. I'm sorry, I just shared money. Sorry. But anyways, the biggest chunk of money we've ever spent on anything. We have a like, house, we have a car. They're really cheap, actually. Well, no. The, but besides that, like on, you know, like, on, you know, just like, boom, here's a chunk of money. Like, you know, I've done our rooms by one sale item at a time, you know? So to like spend 10 grand on patio furniture seemed insane and awesome. And I was so excited. Anyway, and you guys know that what ensued was we would order, we got to do custom stuff, big mistake. I mean, well, actually, no, it wasn't a big mistake. It was a beautiful gift. We ordered custom stuff. Every time it came in, it was incorrect. So pieces didn't match each other. Fabric didn't match each other. The actual furniture itself didn't match. I mean, every single thing that could possibly go wrong continued to go wrong. How long do you think it takes to get patio furniture? Just a guess. Two years. Two years. I actually... Is that include the 50 pillows? That yes, it does have. I have 50 pillows at my house. Yeah, which is ridiculous. Outside. Yes, outside. So I'll send you a picture. It's ridiculous. But, you know, Anybody the pillows wants some all extra came pillows, in fine. The pillows come came on in fine. Over. But, yeah. Yeah, we have excessive. We give them away. They're free now. There are, I don't have very many shoes, but I have excessive amounts of pillows. I have more pillows than I have shoes in my house. Anyway, so... Two years, these emails went round and round as the furniture came in and tile that we handpicked like disappeared and other things came back in its place. And I mean, just so crazy. And I remember saying to the Lord, what? What does this mean? We're going to land in five million situations that we never wanted to be in. We're going to land in them. Our choices put us in a whole bunch of them. And then there's this other thing called life. And we land in these other circumstances. 
And we go, and so again, I said, Lord, what does this mean? And this was so cool. He said, I have something I want to teach you here. I want to teach you how the kingdom works with economy and commerce and how, the, and, how, and how the world does. And I was like, okay, and patio furniture, seriously? And he started to show me how this woman who owned this business, the business was treating her like a stepchild that would never, ever be enough. That's how the business was treating her. The business was like a parent, a step-parent, not a real parent, who was abusing her every day, telling her, you'll never be enough. And in that atmosphere, everything she did went wrong. Everything she did went wrong. Everything, everything that could possibly be misinterpreted was misinterpreted. Because that's what happens when we're in that atmosphere. When we're in an atmosphere that says to us, you are never enough, we start to behave like we're never enough. Have you, right? You've been there, right? You've been in situations where you're like, why did I say that? Why did I do that? I, I, how did I make that mistake? Because we get hit in these atmospheres where we're never enough. And her business was literally abusing her like a step-parent would abuse a kid. And I went, okay, Lord, then what do I do about that? And he said, let's come in the opposite spirit. Why don't you be the client that will never be displeased? <laughs> ah! Greg was like, let's just fire her and move on. But then I shared with him this, and you, being the amazing man that you are, said, okay. If you want to deal with this, and I don't have to, I guess go ahead. <laughs> That's what he said. And as the, long as I don't have to, I think that was the direct quote. I think it as was long as I don't ever have to deal with this, actually, do what you want to do. Actually, when I shared the whole, he said that before, but when I shared the whole story with him, he said, that makes a whole lot of sense. I think you even got teary. <laughs> I doubt it. It was dusty that day, blew you my You totally cried. Okay, you to anyway, you totally cried. So all that, so I watched the Lord shift and started to stand for her to no longer be abused by her business. I stood for her business to come under the kingdom, which is God is a father who can never be displeased with us. Even when we mess up, he is not displeased with us. His pleasure regarding us doesn't. Does he ache for us? Of course he does. His heart break for us? Does his heart break for the, the, the suffering that we're now going to experience? Absolutely. But it doesn't change how pleased he is with us. It doesn't change his heart for us. And I started to see, and so the Lord started to show me in this situation for two years with patio furniture, that this world's economy operates on needs and lack. Our entire economy, every commercial that you watch is based on what you lack and what you need. You buy things because you need them and you lack them. That's how our economy is driven. But the economy of the kingdom is based on, I'm going to have you put up this word now, satisfaction. It's based on God's satisfaction. And if you look up satisfaction, satisfaction has meanings in the mathematical world, in the creative world, and in linguistics. And in all of those different worlds, satisfaction always means the same thing. It's perfect and complete, lacking nothing. When you satisfy an equation, you know this, Adrian, it is balanced, it is satisfied. It's complete, perfect, lacking nothing. And James said, when you experience this, when you experience negative things, you don't experience them so they will build character. You experience them so that you will discover your character that's already in you so that you will then know that you are perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James 2. What? So I have learned how to start operating in relationships and to build boundaries in my life, which means that, what do those boundaries look like? It means one of the things we mentioned when you go on, your husband, uh, Jared mentioned, I love that. When you go on vacation, you don't stay, right, at the same place. You hang out with them for some hours, but you don't stay with them. You start putting boundaries in place that you never would have thought of that actually open the door for love that you were trying to solve 
by having no boundaries based on lack and need. What? Okay, so comment, and we need to get the kids because I think we're at time. So I want to... Oh, and by the way, I'll just say this. <laughs> While you're thinking about if you want to share something or not, if your heart's pounding, bitterness and blowing up is not a healthy choice for building boundaries. Everybody with me on that? <laughs> yelling and screaming because you've had it because somebody... So when you find yourself yelling or bitter, what does that mean? It means that you have somebody in, in a space that they don't belong. So you need to re-communicate the values that you have for that space so that both of you can choose to be powerful people and no longer bitter. So good. When you find yourself blowing up, it's because you haven't learned how to value your own voice and you let it go too long. And at the heart of not valuing your voice is this, and I'm gonna have you put this right here, and that just means the whole thing, which is learning how to value your life. The heart of becoming a powerful person which James talks about all throughout James. The heart of being a powerful person is someone who values their life. We have spent our life, I loved Adrian what you were talking about last week when you were saying like the martyr thing. I totally grew up wanting to be a martyr. <laughs> and the Lord goes, how about you live a magnificent life instead? <sighs> how about you do that? How about you live a magnificent life? Um, okay, so comments. That was good stuff, Angela. Thank you. It's good to be back here. Uh, I don't know how many of you read the story about the, you know, the pastor who committed suicide the other day. Mega church yeah. pastor, young family man, and you know, obviously we don't know all the pieces, but you know, some of the things were really telling. Like he had, he preached like seven sermons on Easter, and he was still fighting his own stuff, and he went on a missions trip, and um, you, you just can't help wonder if if he had been, like you described earlier, autonomous from the needs of others if he might not still be here today, mm -hmm. you know? So he thought he was being selfless yep. by giving himself for everybody else and ended up, of course, not even owning his own life and destroying the lives of his, his church and, I mean, his family and his church and everything. You know, there's a reason why we actually came up with this theology of giving ourselves away. I don't know if you know, any of you know the history of that. Um, there's a phrase in Greek where Jesus, it says he poured himself out. It's the English translation that many of us look at. But it's not, that's not actually what that says. Um, or it not poured himself out, but he emptied himself. And all throughout Hebrew and the Hebrew faith, there is this idea of, um, they sometimes translate it as emptying, but that's not accurate. It's um, because emptying means that you're then empty. And we've actually built a theology around emptying ourselves, right? Less of me, more of God, when actually the Lord's like, that doesn't even work that way. Do you not understand? Like, you have to be fully you, and I have to be fully me for this thing to work. Like, you don't become less. <laughs> like, we got to do this thing together. And that's where that theology came from, was this idea of emptying, which is a really misunderstanding of this beautiful Hebrew rich thing, which is a godlike quality of pouring yourself out and it's actually called an outpouring I didn't know that when we named the church outpouring by the way super cool when I found that out I got goosebumps all over me and it is about how we well you can imagine I mean you can look it up yourself but it is this giving out of ourselves having initiative with flow with force never ending it is a life release of ourselves in partnership with God but that's actually where that theology came from that we empty ourselves on behalf of others is a misunderstanding of a beautiful rich concept of actual true outpouring like isn't that wild I was raised in the emptying yourself theology <laughs> not the pouring yourself out with renewable resource that doesn't end.
Okay, th th thanks for, yeah, that's a heartbreaking situation. Who else wants to comment? Kids are coming back in, we're like super delayed, so maybe we'll just jump in. Tarby's having a hard time finding them. Oh, because they went on an adventure. Okay, they went on an let's adventure. give one or two comments and I'll get my mic off and, um, and Lindsay's gonna come up and, sorry, I was waiting on them and I realized I don't have to wait on them. So, anybody else wanna comment? I am so not uncomfortable right now. <laughs> Just teasing, I'm really not. I used to wait like two seconds and Greg goes, that's not long enough. So Lynn's is gonna borrow the microphone and then I'll give you mine back. And she's gonna host us in our time of listening to God because we are so passionate about people learning how to hear God that this is what we've been doing from the very beginning is this practice of learning how to hear God. And it truly is practice. It's like soccer, it's like volleyball, it's like anything else, art. You don't know how to do it. You learn how to listen to hear God and I believe that hearing God is our birthright. It isn't a gift, it isn't available to just some. None of us are kept from hearing our Father's voice and his satisfaction for us. Living from a place of satisfaction instead of a place of dissatisfaction requires that we hear how he feels about us and about every one of our life circumstances. So, um, it's usually Jared and Lindsay, and as you know, um, but it's Lindsay today, and I'm gonna have Greg um, just walk around with mics. So, why don't you introduce us to what it is that we're doing while I'm unmiking, and then okay. we'll go from there.